Welcome to FOSS North 2020, a virtual event. I'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners. Welcome. Thank you, Johan. And yeah, are my slides. And yeah, welcome to my talk, QMO Demystified, where I will be diving a little bit into the internals of QMO to show you that it can be used beyond just running your normal virtual machine and instead for some hardware adjacent software development. So most of you may have already used QMO, but just to reiterate, QMO terms itself a machine emulator and virtualizer. And the nice thing about this is that it's open source, so we can actually use it to later emulate our own machines, which is what I'm hinting at today. In general, it emphasizes speed over cycle accuracy. We will see what exactly that means later. And it terms itself as having three main use cases, full system emulation, virtualization, and user mode emulation. We will be mainly looking at full system emulation, but I encourage you to also try the other two, especially user mode emulation is just really magical when you run an ARM binary on your x86 laptop or vice versa. It's almost like having Rosetta on your open source system. But we will today be diving, as I said, into full system emulation with a special eye on how you can use the open source nature of QMO to use it for embedded development. So first, let's look at what is in this full system that we're emulating so that we know all the components that we need to emulate. In QMO thinking a machine, so a system, they call it a machine, consists of three different components. First, you have memory, then you have your actual processor, and then you also have devices. Memory and devices are a little bit similar, as we will see soon, and the CPU is actually the tricky part. I will speak about all three of those. So let's first look at memory, where we have two main problems. One is that the address space of our virtual machine and the address space of the underlying QMO process, of course, do not match. We might have our physical memory in the virtual machine or in the machine that we're emulating mapped to a specific memory address. And of course, that memory address might be overloaded inside of the QMO process. So we need some way of resolving those addresses. QMO does this via what is called memory regions. And a memory region can either be a container for other regions, or it can be a leaf node. As you can see here, it could be RAM, it could be ROM, or also devices can be memory regions. So that is what I teased at earlier. Uh, devices and memory are really similar. And the second thing that we need to think about is how to actually get the memory, in this case RAM, for our process. And because we are not talking about small amounts of bytes on Unix or POSIX systems, um, what you get is just anonymous memory mapped memory. So you get full counts of pages in RAM. And if you then look how it actually looks like uh, when you're when you're reading from that or writing to that, you find code a little bit like this. So this is taken from actually QMU itself. All code I'm showing today is taken from QMU, sometimes a little bit squashed uh, for readability. And you can see that indeed, we're literally just taking the memory region, asking for the RAM block, the address in the host, and then we add the offset for our virtual machine and voila, we get our byte and can return it. So memory access isn't all that difficult. And it's the same for devices really, as we saw earlier. They're also just modeled as memory regions. So for example, here we have a simple 8250 UART uh, that we're emulating. And while in x86, this might be bound to an IO port, uh, in all other machines, it will just forward to this function, but basically you're just writing a reader. And indeed you can see we're reading a byte from the receive buffer register and then returning it. And in between we can update the interrupts, uh, which I will talk about later in the processor. 
So also devices are really simple. We only need to implement a read function and a write function, and then we can emulate our device. So this is the first way in which QEMU can be used for this embedded development. If you're developing a device to be used with a machine, you can just implement a read and a write function and get to town writing a driver for Linux or your embedded operating system or your bare metal uh, drivers, whatever you want, and can already get testing with only the specification of your device, even though you don't have the actual device. And all you need is a read and a write function. Now we get to the actual heart of the machine, the processor. And since we're doing full system emulation, we are looking at the case, or we want to look at the case, where the ISA of the guest is different from the ISA of the host, which means we cannot just simply take the code that, uh, that our guest is running and run it on our own CPU. Instead, we need to do some kind of translation. And the way that QEMU does this is really similar to how a compiler would do it. In fact, the TCG you see here stands for Tiny Code Generation, Tiny Code Generator, which is basically a compiler. And overall, we need three steps. First, we decode from our source instruction set architecture into an intermediate representation, pretty much what all compilers do nowadays. Then we take this intermediate representation, which is QEMU specific, and translate it via this QEMU compiler into x86 code or our host instruction set architecture, and then we execute it. What is interesting here is that while you might think that we have this end-to-end mapping that you get with a lot of compilers when you have this intermediate representation, this is actually not the case for QEMU. If you try to run it, it will very specifically tell you which guests it will run. So this specialization already happens at compile time if you have a binary for QEMU. So the, the QEMU binary itself, it will only host one guest. And of course, it will only run on one kind of host system. So let's, ah, and another thing, uh, we might not always have all the code that we want to run in the guest right away. So what is also a part of the TCG is that it acts as a just-in-time compiler or a dynamic code generator. So that means that we won't be translating the full, uh, the full instruction stream ahead of time. Instead, we will be doing it in small steps uh, as as is needed. So now to the decode part. So this is a small Fibonacci function in risk five. Uh, I don't expect anybody to read this uh, and understand what it means, just uh, to, to have a general understanding. These are basically the bytes that we want to decode. And if you now imagine handwriting a decoder for all of this, this would be rather arduous. But QEMU thankfully provides us with something called a decode tree. And that is basically a way to specify decoders for arbitrary instruction set architectures. For example, here is the decode tree that covers most of the instructions seen previously, which are mostly adds. Even the moves and so on are basically adds in RISC-V. And you can see that we can specify the fields, where they begin, how long they are. And then we can also specify formats, which are basic, which are just combinations of different fields. And then finally, we can specify our instructions with the fixed set of, uh, with the fixed bits, so that the uh, decoder knows or the parser knows which instruction is meant. And then all of those variables will be automatically filled for us. Of course, that only gets us to the parsing part. Now we also want to emit the actual intermediate representation. And for that, we need to implement those stub functions. So for each of the instruction or instruction families that we defined in the decode file, we now need to write one of uh, one such stub function. And here, 
basically all we're doing is we're emitting this intermediate representation into a global uh, TCG context to then later be compiled into our host ISA. And you can see that this argument uh, object actually contains all the arguments that we defined earlier. So you see the destination register, you see the source register, and you even see the immediate. And we can hand all of that over uh, to the TCG generator, uh, to the TCG, uh, to then later generate, to first generate the intermediate representation and then boil it down to the host ISA instruction stream. So now we're at the intermediate representation and we actually want to build it into the host ISA. For that, we actually compile everything into one large array in the host, in the TCG context. And on top of that, we will have small translation blocks that delimit uh, the start and the end of, of a block of translated code. This is what I talked about earlier. We can't just translate everything. Instead, we hack our code into multiple translation blocks, where a translation block is basically everything up to a jump. So if we go back, you could uh, back to three. Uh, you would have a translation block up here because here's the first jump. Then you would have another translation block here and another translation block here. And the thinking behind that is that we know that if we enter the translation block, we will run all the instructions in order. And there is no way to, to uh, divert from this instruction stream because that would require a jump. And on jump, we close the block and create a new one. So those translation blocks basically just delimit the space between two jumps. And whenever we want to execute code, we just need to look up the translation block at a certain address, and then we can say execute it. And this is exactly what happens in the execute phase. All that I explained just now, the decoding, the translation, it happens on demand in the main loop. So the main loop asks for a translation block associated with a certain address in the instruction stream. And either it gets the already translated block or it creates a new one, which means it asks first the decoder to decode all the instructions and then the TCG to actually generate the host code. So now we have this translation block fetched by the main loop. Next step we need to do is to actually get into the translation block. For that, we have a prologue that knows how to switch from the QMO process into the, not really into a different process, but into the mode that we need to be in to, to execute this just written memory. So the prologue handles all of that. And when we get back, we also need to get back to the main loop. So every translation block, the jump does not actually point towards where it wants to jump. Instead, it jumps into the epilogue and gives the target address as an argument. And the epilogue can then translate this target address into the ID of the corresponding translation block so that the main loop could fetch it or create it as needed. So we have the prologue and the epilogue to get in and out of our uh, translation block. And those are already generated at the beginning. So those don't get generated per translation block, but only once. But the TCG links especially the end of every translation block to the epilogue. This is especially helpful because going back from the translation block into the epilogue and especially into the main loop is expensive. The main loop does a lot of bookkeeping. For example, it looks whether we have an interrupt request, whether there have been other exceptions coming in that we need to handle. And doing that every time uh, we, we get back from a translation block would actually cost us a lot of time. You saw before how small those translation blocks can be. So instead, QMO gives us a mechanism called translation block linking or block linking. Basically, what we want to do is to, to in the epilogue already, fetch the next translation block. And if it 
is known that this translation block exists, then we can just immediately jump in there. In effect, that means that every translation block can have up to two following translation blocks. And then we can just quickly chain those uh, together without going back into the main loop. As an example, we have here again the Fibonacci. And so in the beginning, we would just jump here. And even though we would continue, it actually jumps back because this is a jump instruction. And then we would see that we are not taking it and going forward. This would happen here and the next step too. But you will notice that each time the block is linked to the next block and even the self-link will, will happen. And then the next time we want to run our Fibonacci function, we only have to enter the prologue once and we will actually jump into the epilogue quickly here uh, to do these links, but we will not return to the main loop. So we will spend most of our time just in the code segment, in the translation context, in the TCG context. Um, so we also won't have a lot of switching in the instruction cache and just can quickly run all of our code. And this is actually what it means that we are not cycle accurate. A, we run a whole translation block at a time and B, we might even have this linking where we run quite fast and it might be that some other event that is happening isn't seen at the exact same moment. So if you have very timing critical hardware, you might not be able to emulate this as exact as you want. Now you have another problem here, which is the problem of interrupts. If I have this chain and this chain might grow very long for large linear programs, then how do I actually handle an interrupt because interrupts are only handled in the main loop? The answer is interrupts actually have a small mechanism to unlink this. Basically, they tell the epilogue function, hey, there's an interrupt pending. And then the epilogue will know not to go into the next step, but to just go back to the main loop and then let the main loop handle the interrupt. So I hope this gave you a small overview of the lowest level of QMO and with the knowledge of what is going on there, you can now imagine what is possible beyond just being a user of QML. For example, you could emulate a new device to write drivers for it. You could debug a boot flow, uh, especially if you have a, a hardware board and your system just won't boot. It can be hard to really figure out where it is getting stuck. QML allows you to just attach a debugger to the guest system, and then you can figure out where exactly it's stopping. You can single step through everything. You can even load, if you have it, a nice uh, memory map and have proper C code in your GDB uh, so that you can do all kinds of breakpoint magic and that you're used to from your normal code, which makes debugging boot flows really nice. You could also think about emulating a new machine. For example, if you get a board that doesn't have a machine description yet. You can just emulate a new machine because now you know it's just memory, devices, and a processor. And if most of those are already there and QMO has a wide library for most common devices, then you can just plug it together, emulate the machine that you're developing for and write, for example, the boot flow or also custom drivers for it. And last but not least, especially with RISC-V, and other ISAs, it is possible to modify them. So if you're like me, a software person, but really interested in what is possible with RISC-V, you might just adapt the decode tree and write a new instruction. For example, a nice toy instruction to build is the count set bits or count zeros, or find the, the number of steps you need to take until you find the first set bit. All of those are quite easy to build inside of QMO, so you can also use it as a platform for ISA experimentation. And if you're now wondering where exactly to find all that stuff, here is the general overview of the different directories. Um, this can be especially helpful because in the beginning, 
you might be confused between target and the ISA and TCG and the ISA. Here it is important to note target is the front end. So for the guest that you're emulating and TCG is the back end. So the host. So if you're developing a new machine or a new ISA, you probably want to spend most of your time in target and not in TCG. But of course, if you want to port QEMU to a new host, then probably here is where you want to spend most of your time. That concludes my task and talk, uh, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we do have one question from uh, Evgen here. Uh, does this mean that the ISR can only be executed on jump instructions where the epilogue is executed? Uh, yes. So if you have a really long run without a jump instruction, then you usually won't be able to get an ISR in between. However, there is a maximum length for a translation block. Uh, I think it's 512 instructions, but I would have to look it up. So if you actually, um, if you have a super long uh, run, then the epilogue is inserted artificially in between and you actually get a maximum size limit on translation blocks. But yes, um, you, you cannot have ISRs at, uh, at every location you wish. You can drive it in single step mode and that way uh, get your ISR seen. But of course, that requires you to either hit next or step in GDB or drive it some other way, and then you lose most of the speed advantages. Does that answer the question? Again, he's typing. Yes, it did. <laughs> I also see that Sentinel is typing. While he's doing that, I'd like to ask you, what, what's sort of the, the, the build time when working with these teams? Is it is it convenient to work with Kimo, or is it like do a change, so, wait an hour, do another change? So it, it uses Mison. So if you, uh, if you just ed edit some of the files, then it will smartly only recompile that. So you can have compile times of like five seconds, 10 seconds. Of course, if you do a full rebuild, it might take like five minutes or so, but that is, or 10 minutes, but that is running on like a four core middle class laptop. So your mileage may vary, but it's definitely not in the in the times of hours. Compiling the Linux kernel, if you're writing a driver there, is probably going to take you more time than recompiling your your QMO model. Thank you. Let's see. So something is still typing. I'm I'm waiting for his question here. There we go. Uh, he wanted to see if I understood correctly that you can use Kimo to write device trees. Uh, and could you explain roughly how to do that? And he also thanks you for his for the extremely interesting talk. Thank you. So yes, a device tree, for those who don't know, is basically a machine readable uh, description of what the hardware looks like. It identifies the addresses and uh, registers of different devices tells you how wide the registers are. And yes, you can actually use QEMU uh, to create such a device tree and load it into the memory wherever you need it. So how exactly the device tree then gets loaded into your kernel or your operating system is, of course, dependent on the ISA and the standards there. But there is a library that allows you to define a device tree. You can also load in already prepared binary device trees and uh, just pull them into the memory, load them into the memory where you can find it. But what doesn't work, what you might want is to automatically generate a machine from a device tree description. That one doesn't work. So you always need to do two things. First, build the actual machine. So you define, I have a CPU and then this is my memory map. The RAM lives at this address and the UART is at this address. And then separately, you will also divide, uh, define the device tree. And you just need to make sure that those two link up. So just divide, defining a device tree in isolation does not guarantee you uh, that actually things happen. Because of course, your kernel might think that there is a device at a sp specific address due to your device tree. But if you haven't instantiated this device with QEMU, 
then nothing will be there and nothing will happen. And of course, your kernel or program will notice this. But yes, it is possible to, to write device trees and debug device trees this way. Then I'd like to thank you a lot for your very interesting talk. Much appreciated. Um, very nice having you here. And I hope to have you in place in Gothenburg next year. Always happy to come. <laughs>